So cognitive load theory is one of the most important theories we can use to improve our teaching and our learning in the technical, vocational, occupational, professional space. So let's quickly look at the definition again before we get into the three types of working memory that's going to be the focus of this video. Right, so a major goal of instruction, it says, so for you as a teacher or a lecturer, is to optimize, to make the best use you can of a learner's allocation of their own cognitive resources. Right, their cognitive, what they've got inside of them. You've got it constructed in such a way that it's best used, that it's effective. And you're going to do that through one, schema construction. And schema construction is all about uh, building knowledge, structured knowledge, which is useful and organized, and then also making sure that it's automated. So you practice and practice and practice it so it becomes light and easy to use. So you're building a learner that knows more and more and can use it more and more effectively. And the reason why you're doing that is because this friggin' thing called working memory, which is fantastic. It's your present space you're thinking and working within. I'm doing it in red, is limited to five or six or seven things you can hold in your mind at once. And especially if you're making sense of it, then it's even kind of less things you can hold together because it's all the links that you're working between it. So now we have to understand how this thing called working memory works because it's limited. This is the thing that's limited. Before that, if you remember, streaming in, uh, we talked about it in another video, you've got all your sensory kind of information coming in from your eyes, what you see, from your ears, what you hear, from your hands, what you're touching, and from the way your whole body is actually working, right? So lots of stuff coming in. Uh, and remember coming out, the schema construction which we are talking about, well, that's your structured knowledge that we're talking about coming out the other side. Both of those are really kind of powerful and can infinitely build. And in between these two, you've got this limited space over here, right, called working memory. Okay, so let's take a look at the three different types that we're talking about over here. So, wait a second, I'm just going to like clean up my, uh, <laughs> my mess. Right, so now the first one which I want to talk about is your intrinsic load. Now intrinsic is a fantastic word. It's referring to the actual complexity and difficulty of the task that you're learning and doing. Right, it's the components of the learning task itself. Right, uh, so let's kind of highlight it. It's the components of the learning task. So it's affected by how difficult the task actually is the task complexity, but crucially, and this is so important, it's by your learner's experience or prior knowledge. The more the learner knows and understands, the more difficult you can make the task. So for example, something like addition and subtraction. For a learner who's just learning that, it's really hard. You've got to break it up into small parts. But if the learner already can add and subtract automatically and knows how to do it, you can make the task more complex. Right, so that's your intrinsic load, the actual uh, difficulty of the the task itself. Now the extraneous load, look at it, it's red, right? And it refers to the load that occurs when learners are using working memory unproductively. They're attending to distractions or when the teaching materials are unclear. Right, so this is when you have a situation where you've got the task the learner's got to do, and then you add all sorts of other crap onto it, all sorts of extras and additions, which sometimes aren't well designed, and the learner's got to kind of work through it and try to work out what's going on. And all that extra work is taking uh, your working memory's capacity away from the actual task itself, because you're dealing with all the other stuff on top of that. Now, crucially, the third one, and you'll see it's in this beautiful kind of like dark gray, bluish kind of color. And that refers to the load caused when a learner is generating, nice word, or refining learning schemas, right? So generating or refining learning schemas, basically what's happening is the learner is asking questions, trying to make sense of it. I would say they're trying to make, the way I like to put it is, they're making meaning. They're thinking about the thing itself, right? Now, your job as a teacher or as a lecturer 
is to try and make sure that you reduce this extraneous load. You make it less. And by making it less, what you're doing is you're enabling the space for the learners to think about things more. You're creating more germane space so that you actually have a situation where instead of wasting the learner's time on all sorts of extra crap, you're actually spending that time making sure that the task they're doing, they can make meaning of it. And why do you want to make meaning of it? Well, let's go back. You want to make meaning of it so that they can build their knowledge. Because the more they build their knowledge and the more automated it gets, the more you relieve working memory from the strain of having to do things because they actually understand what's going on. So at the heart of it, there we have how um, cognitive load theory has three different types of working memory and how your job as a lecturer is to make sure you increase the germane load at the cost and at the expense of the extraneous load. Design your lessons so that the learner actually knows what's going on and can make meaning of that lesson. That's the heart of uh, cognitive load theory.